An audit report from the Office of the Auditor General of the Federation has just indicted the Nigerian police force for failing to account for about 178,459 arms and ammunition. The said firearms were said to have disappeared from the police armory in 2019 without trace or formal reports on their whereabouts. However, the audit report was just a drop in the ocean, as Boko Haram terrorists operating in the northeast have been caught or hung down on numerous occasions with military-grade ammunition, rocket-propelled grenades, and ammo tanks belonging to the Nigerian army. Now joining us to discuss arms proliferation in the country and the role of the security agencies in fostering insecurity is Kabiru Adamu, a security risk management and intelligence specialist and managing director of Beacon Consulting uh, Limited. Uh, good morning, Adamu, and thank you for joining us. Happy New Year. My pleasure, Ruben. Uh, Happy New Year. Thank you very much. Well, quickly, I mean, what is the standard uh, operating uh, procedure uh, for the security agencies? Is the disappearance of uh, unserviceable arms, for example, part of the standard operating procedure? And, you know, what, what are we dealing with here? Uh, police firearms disappearing and nobody being able to account for it. And here the Office of the Auditor General is raising a query. And more than 24 hours later, we have not had a word from the uh, police headquarters. Is that part of the standard operating procedure that the police hierarchy often talks about? Uh, well, the um, weapons handling procedure of our various security agencies are very clear. Um, first off, uh, each uh, security department that has the mandate to possess weapons um, has an armory. Now, the weapons issuing, the weapons collection, and the usage of that um, weapon is managed by both the, arm the armorer and the processes involved in that armory. Now, interestingly, in the Auditor General's report, he has mentioned a few things. So, for, as an example, the arms register that is meant to be the process for which these weapons are being issued and, and are, be, are being collected. He's also mentioned a procedure for reporting both on serviceable as well as um, where these weapons are lost. And he has clearly indicated in that report that there he identified um, lack of compliance with those procedures for both the collection as well as the reporting of um, unserviceable and of um, stolen or, or lost um, weapons. So clearly, there is um, a procedure. Unfortunately, what we're dealing with is a failure of compliance with that procedure. And it also seemed we're dealing with a failure of accountability. Um, what that report tried to do is to trace a period uh, probably about from 20, 2000 up to um, 2019 about um, 19 years, um, during which uh, sub, you know, consistently there has been an abuse of th these procedures and, as it were, a lack of accountability for those that um, abuse that procedure. Now, we can also take it a little bit further and try to correlate this um, abuse, this lack of compliance, with the current security situation we have in the country. Um, what is the percentage of the contribution of these weapons that have either been stolen or that were willingly, and I use the word now willingly, um, loosely contributed by you know, corrupt um, security personnel, or that were in one way or the other um, you know, siphoned into the gun running channels that exist in Nigeria and that have found their way to the hands of um, non-state actors, criminals, bandits, terrorists that have been um, you know, affecting the country with different forms of um, security challenges. Um, interestingly, we did a, um, a survey last year and we found that um, there is a significant percentage of the small arms and light weapons that are in circulation in the country at the moment that are actually um, serviced issued weapons, either from the military or from the, from the police or the, sev the other uh, six or thereabout um, you know, ministries, departments and agencies with which, who have constitutional mandate for the possession of weapons. So we're dealing with a very huge issue a big problem, and, and perhaps in the course of the conversation we would talk about the consequence of all of this within our, the geopolitical space called Nigeria. 
Well, thank you, Kapiro. Let's talk about the consequences. You're completely right in the sense that there is a procedure because that Auditor General report refers to a paragraph 2603 of the financial regulations, how things ought to be done, is clearly stated there. It also refers to a particular squadron in, in Abuja where not a single weapon was reported as missing, whereas they've lost or done whatever, we well, use the word willingly loosely, so I'll avoid being too accusatory, but there's, it can't be accounted for, and that's where we are. What are the consequences? As Dr. Abati said, we haven't heard any kind of statement. There's been an incident in Lagos with the Commissioner of Police of Lagos, and the police was quick to issue a statement to address that. And here, radio silence. So in this instance, um, from what we know, that report was submitted to the National Assembly. And there are committees within the National Assembly that have the mandate uh, to relate with, uh, as an example, in this instance, it's the um, Office of the Auditor General of the Federation, and of course with the um, police as it were. Um, so we're, perhaps, I mean, I can hazard a guess and say the reason why the police hasn't responded is because during the audit process, um, now just to give you, uh, as in, in terms of background, I did work as an auditor, so I have a very good idea of how the audit process works. Um, I'm almost certain that during the audit process, the Office of the Auditor General of the po Police interacted very well with the police. And in fact, in the report, it mentioned, um, is, um, you know, there were comments around what it called the arms register. There were comments around, um, you know, several aspects of uh, the policing uh, standard operating procedure that gave, that told, that told me clearly it did interact with the um, Office of the Inspector General of the Police and perhaps the armament unit within, within the police. So there was an opportunity during that process for the police to make available what, what um, its own side of the story as it were. Now, we've gone beyond that stage. What this report is doing is taking its findings to the National Assembly and then asking the National Assembly to exercise its oversight function and to dig deeper and answer um, these questions. Um, now, as you're aware, the National Assembly is on recess, uh, so it's likely that when they resume, that we would hear from these relevant committees what they are going to do about that report. But beyond that, I'm hoping too that the Ministry of Police Affairs and perhaps to an extent the Police Service Commission would also come in because frankly, this affects the integrity, um, not just the integrity, it affects one critical component of uh, policing, which is the handling of, of weapons. And like I mentioned in my opening remarks, there are issues regarding the weapons handling within the country, and this report has clearly brought that, those issues to the limelight. So there is a responsibility on the side of both the Minister of Police Affairs, the Police Service Commission, the Office of the Inspector General of Police, and the Parliament, the relevant committees within the Parliament for which this report was submitted, to issue a statement and to clarify um, you know, their own position on that. Now, in terms of consequences, um, we are dealing with several security challenges within the country. Um, I do keep uh, a database of um, security incidents. In 2021, we are looking at a situation where more than 8,000 people were killed in Nigeria. And I can bet you, uh, as sad as it may sound, we come within the top three of countries that have, with, with that, that type of fatal fatalities across the world. Um, by the time bodies like the Global Terrorism Index and several others released their, um, you know, inf the, the report for 2021, um, Nigeria is most likely going to come somewhere within the top, the top three. Um, and it's very clear that one of the issues that is driving insecurity in Nigeria is the proliferation of small arms and light weapons. So clearly, whatever we do, in addressing the security challenges, if we do not address this proliferation of small arms and light weapons, then um, frankly, we're just um, playing, our, playing around. And in this instance, we have been given um, basis to commence an investigation to find out why the custodians of weapons, legal custodians of weapons, have become a major contributory element to this proliferation of small arms and light weapons within the country. So in a nutshell, that's um, you know, the consequence, as it were. Uh, a driver of insecurity in Nigeria is this proliferation of small arms and light, and light weapons. And a significant percentage of that proliferation is coming from our security agencies, unfortunately. All right. Uh, 
So this is quite shocking, the story coming out. But I remember, I think in 2018, there was a survey done on arms in the hands of non-state actors and other elements. It was about 6.18 million arms in the hands of those people. And in the hands of authorities, state actors and the like, you've got, I think, just 15,000 shy of 600,000, 585,000. Is this 178,000 minus the 585,000? And how can we have like a, a directory to be able to ascertain the level of arms we have in the country as we speak, maybe in the hands of non-state actors and the likes, so we know what we're dealing with? Because this is scary. These numbers are really scary. It's like yes, war zone stuff. It's like, it's like Srebrenica kind of stuff. Um, Rufai, so um, I did, like I said, I did a survey. My consultancy, Beacon Consultant, did a survey last year. And um, some of those figures you mentioned were what we came up with. Um, so in terms of um, the number of small arms and light weapons in circulation in the country, we came up with a conservative figure of 6.5 million. And um, like you indicated, we tried to establish um, how many are in the hands of our law enforcement um, agents. And we came to a figure of about 587. And, um, you know, it's not difficult to determine that if you look at the police, the number of police, the number of um, military personnel we have, those that uh, can, can bear weapons, that is because there are administrative uh, personnel within them that don't bear weapons, as an example. So anyway, we came up with 587 for all the nine uh, mini agencies, uh, you know, that have mandate to bear weapons. So what it means is that if you subtract that 587 from 6.5 million, you now have a large pool of about 5 point something million that, that um, as it were, uh, have um, weapons. Now, we also try to establish how many licenses were issued by the police, because uh, like the Weapons Act um, you know, contains, only the Inspector General of Police, who derives his power from the President, can issue um, licenses for bearing weapons. And as you probably are aware, uh, for some time now, I think almost two years or thereabout, the Inspector General of Police's office has um, stopped the issuance of licenses for you know, the type of weapons that private individuals can, can bear. Uh, however, what we did is to do um, a kind of survey where we went to the B department in all the uh, police formations, and then we came up with well, an, an informed figure, as it were, of about a million um, licenses that were issued. So add that million to the 587,000, what you have um, would be about 4.9 million in, um, in the hands of non-state actors. Now, these non-state actors would include vigilantes at the state level who, as you are probably aware, in certain states do bear arms. Um, and then, of course, the other non-state actors that keep you and I awake at night, uh, groups like the Jamaat al-Ali, Sunal al Dawat al jihad in the Northeast, um, the Islamic State in West Africa province, and then um, the... Uh, bandits, as it were. I hate to use this word, it's, it's really un unconventional, but it is what it is, um, that are operating in the Northwest and not, not central states. So the rest of that, that three million plus, are in their hands. So now if you move further and try to do a ratio, how many are in the hands of these non-state actors and the ones that are in the hands of our security agencies? Now you can understand why in broad daylight, you would have a situation where sometimes these non-state actors attack locations and they successfully um, get away with it. Uh, we also went further to determine, in terms of um, the proportion of the contribution of the dif different elements that uh, were from where these weapons come in. Some of them come from international routes. Uh, Libya was identified, Mali was identified, and the whole Sahel, as it were, where uh, we have gone running channels through which this come from. But more interestingly, we also identified, just like the Auditor General's report indicated, that the armory of our security agencies is also a contr contributory element to these um, weapons that are in circulation. And then further, there are local manufacturing, um, gun manufacturing you know, industries in Nigeria, in places like um, in um, Kaduna State, as an example, um, several locations in the Southeast and in the Southwest that were also producing something like the AK-47. Um, and it was interesting that those AK-47 um, are not very different from the ones that are produced internationally. There were issues around their ammunition, around precision, 
and um, several other elements. But in terms of the product itself, they were not very, very different. And um, then the last one, again, is the corrupt elements within the security agencies who we discovered were also, unfortunately, running um, some backdoor you know, uh, platforms through which weapons can be obtained. So that is the situation, Rufai, where we are. Uh, interestingly, um, the government realizes this. For a few years now, there has been an attempt by the government to set up uh, this commission on small arms and light weapons. And I, I can boldly say that last year, the president appointed um, an individual to head uh, you know, a part, a unit within the Office of the National Security Advisor for the mopping up of these small arms and light weapons. He also submitted um, a bill to the National As Assembly for the creation of um, the Small Arms um, and light, light Weapons Commission. Before then, Senator Smart at ADME, as you probably are aware, had submitted another bill. So what we're waiting for at the moment is to see how all of this effort by both the executive arm of government and the legislative arm of government can be harmonized so that we can have a functional commission that would look at all of these issues, including the ones that were raised by the, this report by the Office of the Auditor General of the Federation. Well, Kabira Adamo, yes, the uh, Office of the Auditor General of the Federation has sent this report uh, to the National Assembly. But you recall that in the past, we had issues in terms of how the National Assembly uh, treated some of the reports. Persons, ministries, departments, and agencies that reportedly made away with uh, government uh, property <coughs> or that could not account for money, uh, nothing happened. In this latest report, it's the same thing. So there is no guarantee that the intervention of the National Assembly will make any difference. But this report is out there in the uh, public domain, and it is frightening to hear that weapons, you know, uh, and uh, ammunitions will just disappear from uh, police uh, custody. And as you have pointed out, you know, these weapons, they tend to find their uh, way into the hands of non-state actors. What remedies uh, are available to the Nigerian state to make sure that, you know, this problem is addressed? Whatever the National Assembly uh, comes up with, what the Office of the Auditor General is telling us is that we have a very serious security crisis. If the police cannot keep their own uh, arms and ammunition, what do you think government should, should do? Uh, you know, what are your recommendations? And who needs to be sanctioned? Um, thank you, uh, Ruben, for this question. So, um, you know, at, at the risk of um, sounding a bit, uh, you know, uh, um, pedest pedestrian as it were, my resolution for 2022 is to contribute to stopping the inertia that we found ourselves in in Nigeria. Uh, I mentioned um, lack of accountability, uh, which unfortunately is a key um, issue within our security architecture. Um, last year, I monitored several infractions within the security architecture, and I cannot point to one individual that was sanctioned for those infractions. We need to, we need to change that, and it, that responsibility is on all of us. And I must commend you, Rice TV, uh, this platform highlighting this report um, when the, your sister you know, platform um, this day reported that issue, I saw how several other media uh, platforms took it up. And so that, that's a good beginning. Your role in the media uh, is critical. Um, let's not let this go off the, um, the, you know, the, the, the burner. Let's, let's continue talking about it. Uh, it. It would help uh, put it out there so that government is aware and it, it does the necessary thing. The second element is our civil society organizations, they have a responsibility to continue discussing this. Now, um, I know there are several of them that are involved in security sector, uh, for lack of a better word, governance, reform um, is issues. And so this is the t uh, another opportunity for them to take it up, to look critically at what um, they can do in terms of bringing in our development partners to assist the security departments in terms of looking at their weapons handling um, you know, capac capacities and capabilities. They, like, like the Auditor General report mentioned, it's not just at the level of formations. It goes beyond, um, you know, security formations. We are looking at the police now. How about the military? Uh, you and I were all witness to when at a parliamentary sitting, a senior, um, I think it was a Navy uh, official, accused our neighboring countries, not knowing that, 
you know, that issue was even bigger among us here. I remember some of us were not happy with that statement by her because we knew that that problem was not uh, an issue that was um, peculiar with our neighbors. We also had the same issue. So the civil society organizations can do that, um, bring in uh, support from our development partners to look at the capacity and capability of our security agencies in weapon handling, especially their armories. Um, no matter how good we, po we procure weapons, if we're not able to keep those weapons very well, then they will end up in the hands of our enemies. Um, we can pick the northeast and show clearly how several of the weapons that were procured by the military ended up in the hands of especially the Jamaat al-Alison and Lil Dawat al-Jihad and the Islamic State in West Africa province. In fact, the rockets that were fired into Meduguri on the day the president visited in December, those weapons were from the military um, arm armory. Uh, so they, they are, we, we, the civil society organizations can actually help in, in that regard. And then um, thirdly, the um, parliament, in this instance, a report has been submitted to the parliament. They should do the rightful thing. Yeah, you've indicated um, uh, you know, how in the past they failed in terms of you know, uh, investigating this. But there are also instances where they've done amazing jobs in terms of following up on reports that were submitted on them and then getting to the bottom of it. In this instance, the report has showed clearly the um, issues of lack of compliance. So they've got a basis to commence a parliamentary investigation. And then as it were, uh, it can be punitive, it can be corrective, or a combination of both. I would recommend a hybrid system where individuals that were found wanting in terms of infractions are uh, penalized. And then of course the corrective measures that would ensure there is no reoccurrence of that. Um, and then finally, um, we Nigerians, now um, one way or the other, especially the administrative component within the various security departments, they have a responsibility to look into processes we talked about standard operating procedures. Those are the guiding principles for which all of these things can be achieved. So we need to look closely at the standard operating procedures that guide the functions of a lot of these departments and enhance, um, you know, especially the um, accountability element within that. You know, uh, I learned something from you know, my stay in Europe where there is this uh, saying that um, trust is good, but control is better. So no matter how well you trust an individual and you give him a responsibility, insert control measures so that where there are infractions, you can immediately point out those infractions. And where he fails to um, you know, change or, as it were, adjust, then you penalize him. Um, it's not uh, acceptable that we have an instance where 178,000 plus of weapons um, over a period have been you know, lost, as it were. Uh, it's, it's, it's not acceptable. It's unacceptable, it's scary, but it's not shocking. You'll recall, I'm sure, like five years ago, Major General Lucky Rebel, the theater commander in the northeast of Nigeria, as he then was, said that some soldiers were selling arms and ammunition to Boko Haram. And here we are now talking about this report. What role does the welfare of soldiers and police officers play in this, in terms of their you know, compensation for the work that they do? Um, a, a, a very a critical rule, um, even though I must mention that criminological studies have attempted to uh, look into uh, you know, the correlation between criminality, as it were, and um, you know, social issues like poverty and all that. And frankly, there is no conclusion um, in terms of whether there is a positive correlation where poverty can uh, contribute directly to criminality. But there, where you have poverty, and then you have other elements, um, then yes, it's possible that poverty can be a, a, a basis or a driver for you know, committing offenses or criminality, as it were. Um, what is important, I think, is the absence of these controls that I mentioned. Uh, no matter the rate of poverty, uh, where there are very good controls, then especially the deterrence element within the control system that I am I'm, I'm trying to point, it would make it a little bit difficult for the would-be criminal to you know, at, uh, you know, commit any offense. So in this instance, you issue a weapon to an, an, an official, or even the ammunition um, to an official. And if he knows that there is an accountability system, a standard operating procedure that has good control measures, good accountability systems in it, it would make it very difficult, no matter how tempting it is for him to sell that weapon or to hire them, because that's another aspect of it. Sometimes we hear they hire them. 
if there are good control systems, it would be difficult to do that. So yes, welfare is important, but what is even more important is let's have good control systems, good accountability systems that would um, ensure wherever there are deviations from this standard operating procedures, they are easily identified. And then, of course, the corrective measures are introduced as quickly as possible. We, we, in the Auditor General's report, it showed a period of 19 years of lack of accountability. And frankly, that's not acceptable. I, I'm sorry, I'm repeating this, but I, I don't see how over 19 years, through sub, several inspector generals of police, this issue were, was not identified and it was never corrected. Um, no, it's institutional, it's systemic, and it needs to be corrected. Certainly. I don't think uh, too many people will argue with that. Thank you very much, Kabiru Adamu, for joining us on The Morning Show.